And one thing I've been thinking about over the last couple of weeks, and, and I think this is a, a big problem with people who are newer to trading is you think you need to know everything. You think you need to know fundamentals. And I, I think I did a, I made a good case of why you don't need fundamentals a few weeks back or should never, I guess never is a big word, but you shouldn't use fundamentals in your trading. You should only focus on technicals. And some people say, well, I'll use fundamentals and technicals, but I'll only take the trade if the technicals are there. It's like, well, why not just only take the trade if the technicals are there? It's kind of like somebody was using this arcane counting method and he had a trend filter on the bottom and he would only take waves that went in the direction of the trend filter. It's like, well, why not just use the trend filter? So when you boil it all down, like we talked about last week or week before, all you have to do to make money trading, I know you just said it done, is, is capture a trend. And the only way to make money trading is to capture a trend. But I think part of the problem is you end up with this analysis paralysis and you plot so many indicators on the chart, you can no longer see the chart. And the bottom line is what you really need to know, especially if you're just getting started. And I did kind of let these things widen out because you will obviously learn things through experience over time. But when you're just starting out, you only need a few things to become successful, and then you could build on those things from there. And you really only need one setup. And Linda Rasky said, all you need is one pattern to be successful. And Linda's right. And people's like, well, what's the one setup? It's like, okay, land your life pullbacks. That's probably the only one that you need, at least when you're just getting started. And here's something that just absolutely amazes me. If you go back in and look at those archives, davelearner.com slash archives, and you're going to see some some ugliness in there. Believe me, you'll see some ugliness that happened recently. We got stopped out of two or three in a row, and it, and it sucks, okay? It, it, but it happens, or I guess I've probably already demonetized. Shit happens, right? But on the big winners, what's amazing is how simple the patterns were. You're going to see Landry Light pullbacks, bow ties, TKOs, and, and all these patterns are going to be very textbook in nature. Now, I'm not just saying you rush out and trade the one pattern right away, make sure you do your due diligence, which we'll get to in just a few minutes. And the other thing I would recommend you do is stay in your lane. And also, here's something I was thinking about right as I'm going live. Throughout the years, people will come to me and they'll start to try to figure out my methodology and I'll help them. And I'll keep, I'll rein them in. They'll go over here, you know, instead of staying in the lane. And I'm like, no, come back here. Just look at this one setup. Just look at this money management. Just do this. And then they're off over there. And what I was thinking about, again, right before I was going live is not only do they go off to chase rainbows and every now and then they hit and miss or something, but what they don't realize is they're they're increasing the, their learning curve by a factor of 10 by trying to learn all these other things and do all these other things. Figure out one thing first, get good at it, do that one thing, and then move on. And the problem that I see quite often is they don't even figure out how to use one pattern of mine, not that I'm the grand poobah, but they did come to me for help, right? So they don't figure out how to use that one pattern and only that one pattern before moving on to all these other things. And I don't know why I could say all these things until I'm blue in my face to stay in your lane and just do this stuff, this simple stuff here. But people, they all have to go out and chase the grail. And I know I did it too early on, but nobody told me early on that, hey, Dave, you don't have to do all these things. And that's why I love doing a presentation on what I wish I knew. It's a good reminder for me when I try to outsmart the market. But it's because when you are first starting out, you're just so confused about so many different things to do. I saw Linda Rasky in a presentation a while back, and she said, your first three years, you don't really know what's going on because you're trying to figure everything out. Well, you don't have to spend three years trying to figure everything out. Spend three years trying to figure out a narrow path. As a friend of mine pointed out when I was telling him about this presentation earlier, he's like, yeah, it's more of a narrow path. And it's like, exactly. Now, I've talked about the knowledge gap quite a bit in prior presentations. And if you go back and look at him, I did a bunch where I, I referenced a lot of material from Douglas, Douglas, uh, Mark Douglas. A lot of this does come from Mark Douglas. And 
I think this comes straight from Douglas. A, a knowledge gap leads you to believe that if you only knew more, you would, you would, if you only knew more, you would not have losses. Not so, the not should be in here. <laughs> and so you have a loss in a trade and you, you tend to think like, well, if I knew more about trading, I wouldn't have had that loss. And that's not necessarily true, but a, a knowledge gap will lead you to believe that something is missing in that. Now, a knowledge gap can also sort of leave you feeling helpless, which can lead to negative questions like, why do I suck at this? And if you if you want answers, ask questions, but make sure you're answering the questions or asking questions in a positive way, like, how do I get better at this, okay? And, and yeah, of course, play devil's advocate with everything, but then make sure you've got the right phraseology that's gonna lead you to a positive solution. Otherwise, you could really end up in a downward negative spiral, both mentally and monetarily. Now, if you're not careful trying to seek something that doesn't exist, you could end up on a grail hunt, okay? There's going to be losing trades, even on good trades. I, the, the ones we got stopped out of recently, it was frustrating, and I thought they were fantastic setups. Well, they didn't work. It happens, you know, spelled a silent SH. <laughs> and then every now and then you catch a nice winner and it pays for it all. But you can end up on this never ending grail hunt and that's like a blind man in a dark room looking for a black cat that doesn't exist. Trade one pattern, get good at that one pattern and then move on. If you're not successful with one pattern, with one setup, you're not gonna be successful with 100. Now, with your trades and provided you've been trading for a little while and you have a narrow focus, that narrow path, you're taking that narrow path and you have losses which are inevitable, then make sure you're doing an honest post-mortem on the trade. Was it really an F yeah type of setup, okay? It's amazing, and, and this is not hindsight, I call it hindsight and foresight, but sometimes you do a post-mortem and you're like, what the hell was I thinking? That's good though, because you're getting better when you start thinking that, right? But you'll say, what the hell was I thinking? This thing was choppy, it wasn't trending. Look at that big fat gap in the middle of the trade. It always amazes me. I tell people, make sure it's trending, ideally persisting in its trend, ideally accelerating in its trend, make sure it trades cleanly, et cetera, et cetera. And then the next day I get a setup that's just all over the place. So there's a big fat gap right in the middle of the setup. And they're like, oh, I like this one. I'm like, well, did you not listen to me about the gaps? You know, and, and there's been a few people that come week after week to the webinars that in spite of all my preaching, they just don't want to see it. And I don't understand why that is. I guess you just can't reach everybody. But you should really look at a setup and feel like an F yeah type of feeling. Feel like you should feel like you'd be stupid not to take the trade. Now, if it is an F yeah setup and it fails, then shout next and you know feel free to drop an F bomb first. Believe me, I get pretty pissed off. I was telling somebody when I first moved in before we had fences between the house when the house was just freshly built, I insulated the office myself and I, I i guess i didn't do the right research uh because i didn't do a good job of insulating it and i remember early on i didn't put windows on this side because i didn't want to look out the window at a neighbor uh the old place that had six acres was nice to look out at the pond and stuff but over here i didn't want to look at a neighbor so i didn't we didn't put windows on this side of the house and one day i was pissed and i dropped an f-bomb and then there was a little echo outside the house from a kid hopefully not too young of a kid, he says, I said, ah, and then it came right back to me, ah, so I was like, okay, I guess you're not, <laughs> you're not in the country anymore, Dave, so yeah, you do get upset, Every, you know, we're all human, so don't let that drag you down, now, as I kind of alluded to earlier, do all the other things I preach, and take that one setup, and find 100, 100 examples, some good, some bad, and some kind of mediocre, and then figure out which ones tend to do better. And, and yeah, a perfect setup, a textbook setup, as I often call them, will sometimes fail miserably. And that's just, you just chalk that up to it happens, right? But the bottom line is, if you do find 100 setups going through charts, go back years, many years, uh, go back 10 years, go back 15 years, go back as long as you want, and look for those setups and see which ones works and see which ones didn't play devil's advocate try to find some that fail miserably okay 
But the bottom line is, as one client told me a while back, the counterfeit currency detectives, they don't look at a bunch of monopoly money. They don't look at something like a, a Zimbabwe note and say, hey, this is, uh, this is, not, this is not really 100 trillion US dollars. This is some Zimbabwe note or something. They actually look at a real $100 bill, study the material, study the threads, study the markings. There's all kind of little things they study. And they study it so carefully that a fake stands out like a sore thumb. So you should focus on that. Focus on what really, really worked, okay? And then over time, you'll have a common denominator. Yes, yeah, some crappy setups will take off. And you just have to say, okay, that's a crappy setup. It took off without me. I don't care. It didn't fit the bill. It, didn't, it wasn't what I normally look for. But if you look at enough of these you will know which the best ones are. And I can give you a few clues. Again, accelerating, persisting, trades cleanly, pulls back deep, but not too deep. Usually the 30 EMA is a good place for that. Sometimes if it's really trending, it won't pull all the way back. Then you're using a different type of pattern, just like a generic pullback or a TKO or something like that. Anyway, you want to figure out which ones tend to work better. And usually all those little things I talked about, looks like I have a misspelling in here. Uh, but do your homework for sure. And one thing I can't preach enough about, and I promise not to go on and on about it tonight, but do your morning pages and just wake up and write three handwritten pages. Doesn't matter what it's about. Sometimes a dog farts. It's like, oh, geez, did it smell that bad when he ate it? You know, she ate it. <laughs> of course, my dog eats poo, so I guess that's a bad, bad analogy. But anyway. You definitely want to do those morning pages. You're going to learn a lot about yourself. You're going to learn a lot about trading from doing that. It's the hardest thing you'll ever do. I tell everybody, I'm, as I've often said, meet on the streets, friends, family, relatives, to do the morning pages, and nobody does them. And the reason is it's hard, okay, because they're worried about grammar or being eloquent or the time. You know, just, just do it and forget about it. And don't preload with anything. Try to stay digital as much as you can. I'm listening to a book. I haven't listened to it lately because I've been doing some other things, which I, I may talk about later, later in, in presentations if it works. But I have recently started listening to a book by Quick, and it's called Limitless. And one thing I don't like about the book is he keeps telling you what he's going to tell you instead of just telling you. That that kind of makes me crazy. I, I get why you have to do that. But whenever I write, I try not to do that. Or when I'm doing presentations, I try not to do that. But anyway, a few things that he talked about is 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 the switching between things is and, and that's something that I'm really guilty of. And I do have ADD and I probably um, it's undiagnosed except from by, by my wife. <laughs> but that really can can burn you out. And he did talk about uh, writing in his book, too, and how that's important for your brain. A lot of things he talked about I'm already doing a lot of things he talks about. I'm not doing or I'm guilty of doing and I'm working on that. And I'll, if it works for me, I'll, I'll be more than happy to share some of these things with you. But do those morning pages. I swear it'll change your life. Just little things like, I said I wouldn't go on and on, but here I go. Just little things like you're worried about something, just write it down. And then what amazes me is six weeks from now, you'll look at that and you'll be like, oh, pff, that turned out to be nothing. Or it's like, yeah, that came true. That happened. But you know what? I dealt with it. It's like it, it builds character. So I would recommend you do that. When you document your trades, I have a digital notebook, which I absolutely love. And I think um, I have an affiliate link, but they would only give you as much as you um, paid for, the, paid into the company or whatever. So I just figured it wasn't worth 300 bucks or whatever it was. But this thing is wonderful, and I just started recently using tags. Again, I kind of forgot about using tags, but I put a tag today. I did something kind of stupid in my trading, and I put a shame tag. And go in and look at those shame tags. And uh, if you're brave enough, start a little notebook with shame on the cover. And if you do something stupid, write that down. But when you're documenting in your trading journal, any morning pages too, of course, but in your trading journal specifically, don't just write, hey, I bought this stock XYZ at this price or whatever. Write why you bought it and write how you're feeling and write what's going on. And then, as I've said a thousand times before, 
I couldn't figure out why I was making these crappy tr these crappy trades right after lunch. But after lunch, everything looked so great. I'd always come in here and make some trades and lose money. And so I started writing down WITO, walk in the office to figure out what the problem was. And I later figured it out, figured out that I was sugar low before leaving my office. And then I'd go to the house, get a snack or get lunch or breakfast or whatever. They'd come back in and I was feeling kind of fat and happy and everything looked beautiful. So it's little things like that through careful documentation. And then I later read or reread about the hangry judge effect. Judges who, and I know I'm kind of beating a dead horse a lot of this, and my apologies for those of you who know me. But the, for those of you who don't, the hangry judge effect was is Israeli, Israeli judges were giving far more harsh sentences in the late mornings than they were in the early afternoons. And then they finally realized that the judges would go out and have lunch or whatever they did, but they'd have some, something to eat in between the sessions. And then they come back feeling better, like, ah, oh, you know, you just murdered two guys. Hey, well, you know, five years, that's good enough. Anyway, so that's where that came from. That's one of many things I've unearthed through all this documentation. So make sure you're talking about your emotions, your feelings, and, you know, any other extraneous influences. Now, it's kind of hard in the middle of the day in your trading journals to write about a lot of your extraneous influences. But your morning pages are going to unearth that. It's like uh, my wife had an injury a few weeks back, and it kind of changed the whole dynamics of everything. I always help around the house. Thought I was a lot of help, but when I had to do everything, it's like, holy moly, there's a lot going on. So I've got all that going on, worried about taking care of her, and then in here and then trying to make money and thinking like, oh, I need to make more money to pay for these things and pay for the ER bills and all this other stuff. She's fine, by the way. She's fine. but. A lot of these things weigh on you. And and as I said before, a friend of mine, we were talking in person, and he said that he had a really bad week and he couldn't figure out why he had such a bad week. And then Friday night after the market closed, I, I'm guessing he had a beer or two or whatever, and he starts relaxing. He says, Oh shit, I know what it was. On Monday, he had to pay like a $40,000 tuition payment. So all week long, in the back of his head, he was probably trying to replace that money. And the market that the market could give two shits about your, your needs or desires or longings or whatever. It's If it's there, it's there. If it's not, it's not. You have to let the market come to you. 